Welcome to Lord of the Harvest Christian Fellowship. And we are recording, as Rob said, from our home. So um, I am Jan Osminski, Pastor Jan, if you don't know me. I'm married to Pastor Mike Osminski. I'm going to open the service and then go right into communion. Well, I'm going to read out of Psalm 20 as our opening today. Uh, it is our our uh, scheduled psalm for the day. And um, here goes. It is written by David. Um, and usually David, and I'm sure all the kings, the Christian, the godly kings, prayed before they went to war. May the Lord answer you in the day of trouble. So right now, today, I feel like this is appropriate for us. May the name of the God of Jacob defend you. May he send you help from the sanctuary, not from the White House, from the sanctuary, and strengthen you out of Zion. May he remember all your offerings and accept your burnt sacrifice. May he grant you according to your heart's desire and fulfill all your purposes. We will rejoice in your salvation, and in the name of our God, we will set up our banners. May the Lord fulfill all your petitions. Now, I know that the Lord saves his anointed. He will answer him in his holy heaven. With the saving strength of his right hand. Some trust in chariots and some in horses, but we will remember the name of the Lord our God. They that trusted in the other things bow down and fallen, but we have risen and stand upright. Save, Lord. May the King answer us when we call. Dear Lord, I ask today that you you appear in all the homes that are watching and you be with them, dear God, that you anoint them and you lead them, Lord, and that they they truly do not trust in chariots or horses, but in this hour of undecision and, um, and confusion, Lord, I ask that Christians turn to you and know that you are the king. You are the leader. And in doing that, Lord, we surrender all that we hold true and lay it at your altar. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, I think it's very interesting that knowing in this hour we have such division in our country about a leader. But as Christians, we know who our true leader is. And I really firmly believe we should not be partaking in any of that uh, chaos. We need to look to Jesus as our, as our God, as our supreme being. It shouldn't matter to us who's in the White House. It should not matter to us who is leading this country because God himself is who we, we listen to. It says right in Psalm 20, we have risen, we stand with God. Now, that's hard to do because in this hour, we know that a lot of us, it might mean giving up things that we want. It might mean saying, oh, well, I guess I don't get the gasoline for $2 a gallon or whatever it is because it's going to change. But who cares? Who cares? We are serving a God and we have lived in comfort, most of us, our whole entire life. And I really believe that in this hour, we're worried about losing comforts more than we're, we're worried about other issues. We're worried about things that we have being taken away from us. You know what? Even if they close churches, I can still pray to my God. I can still follow my God. I can still lift up my God. Now I want us to turn to um, I want us to turn to Exodus 13. Now remember that Moses led his people 
out of out of um, Egypt, and even though they were they were slaves, even though they were miserable, it was what they were used to, and they were happy with that. Believe it or not, well, they said they weren't. But actually, we're, we're creatures of habit, aren't we? And so the thought of leaving that and going to the unknown was very scary for them. So here they are, and they're, and they're leaving their, what they know and going where they don't know. And you know, that's so like us right now. I think that's what's bothering us. We don't know where we're headed. But guess what? God doesn't always share that with us. He doesn't always say, you know what, Jan, I'm going to tell you what your future is going to be. I've yet to get that memo. God wants us to trust in him, for he is a gracious God, full of mercy. Scripture says he will hear us. He will hear our petitions. But God is our leader. He is our guider. He is our deliverer. Now, in Exodus 13, verse 21, and the Lord went before them. You know, the Lord goes before us. Whatever you may be thinking right now in this hour, it seems like God has deserted us. Maybe that's what you feel. Maybe you feel like God has heard your prayers. Whichever side you're on, God is God, not a man in Washington. The man in Washington is a leader of a political system. My God is far beyond that. He rules the universe. So I don't look to that person. I look to our God. So listen what he did. He went before them by day in a pillar of cloud to lead the way. And by night in a pillar of fire to give them light so as to go by day and night. He provided. He gave them light. He protected them from the sun. When they rested in their tents, he waited a while, and then the cloud began to move again. And you know what? They could stay in that tent if that's what they wanted, and they would probably surely die. Or they could get up and follow the cloud. And that's what some of us do. We have set up camp. We have decided that we're not going to follow the cloud anymore. We're going to follow our own needs. We're, gonna, we're going to seek those first. So think about, think about their unsurety. Think about what they were feeling. They weren't confident. They didn't know where they were going. They maybe had never been in the desert their whole lives. Here they are in this wild wilderness. And at night, the pillar of fire represents warmth, represents, again, protection against the cold, and against wild snakes and venomous creatures. It was protection. God protected them by day, by day and by night. And God does the same to us now. We're going into a desert time in this country. We have to be the people that stand up and say, I'm fine. I'm at rest. I'm at peace. Because why? My God is my leader. Now, I want to close with, um, in John, we love John, Gospel of John, chapter 14. Verse 27. Peace I leave with you. How many of us are not experiencing peace at this time? We're experiencing stress. We're experiencing anything but peace. Confusion. Whatever, you can fill in the blank, but it's not peace. My peace I give to you. Wow, Jesus is giving me his peace. His peace that enabled him to walk three and a half years through incredible tribulation and trials. I get that peace too. My peace I give to you. And this is so important. Not as the world gives do I give to you. It's not a worldly peace. You can get a worldly peace. Oh, everything's fine in my house today. Nothing broke. I feel at peace. That's fake peace. We want the peace of Jesus. We want the peace of God. 
that when we are going through the storm right now, we don't say anything but hallelujah, thank you, Jesus. You allow things to happen for your purposes. Let not your heart be troubled. Is that amazing? Let, let not your heart be troubled. How many have hearts that are troubled in this hour? Neither let it be afraid. So many, so many of us feel afraid of what the future is going to hold for us. But God says in his word, do not be troubled or afraid. Take on his peace. So when someone's saying to you this thing or that thing, take a deep breath. Take a very deep breath and cry out to God. He will hear your petition and he will remind you that you have his peace. You are able to overcome the troubles you're feeling. We need to look to our king in this hour, not to a man. We have to let that go. We have to let that fly out the window and trust in God. God can do anything. And, it, and you know what? I work with kids and and sometimes I think about my life compared to some of theirs. Their lives are so tragic. They have suffered such incredible trauma. And that trauma blocks them from experiencing the peace that I am able to feel. It just gets right in there and blocks everything. I pray for those kids. I pray for those kids every day. I try to be Jesus to them every day. I try to bring in peace into my classroom so that they will experience what is so important in this world. Not politics, not economics, not any of that. Jesus didn't care about any of that. He didn't say, I pledge my allegiance to this candidate or I'm worried I won't have any money today, disciples. Or I have a little cough. He worried not ever. Even when he was facing his most incredible obstacle, the cross, he did it willingly. He trusted in his father. So speaking of the cross, speaking of his sacrifice, are we willing to do that? You know, there's a scripture that says no greater love has man than to lay your life down for one another and Jesus definitely did that are we able to even do that no are we even able to do little things are we able to say here here you need money here whatever do you need I just think that in this day and hour we are holding on to our riches so tightly and a lot of what's at the root of our complaints has to do with our needs our needs I want this, I want that. And God wants us to give it all up and trust in him in this hour. So, his body, he gave. He gave freely and it was horrible. I pray, I pray, I pray, dear God, that we always remember what you did for us. That we, when we're surrounded by our enemies, that we look to you and are at peace and at rest, Lord. And may we pick up our crosses, whatever they may be, Lord. And may we be an example of you in this hour. May people look at us and say, why are they so peaceful? Why are they so calm? It's because we serve an amazing God and we trust in him. In Jesus' name, thank you for your body. And Lord, blood, there's life in the blood. We know there's life in the blood. And you shed your blood for us to give us life. Lord, we love you. We are amazed. And you know, when I think about the story, the story you you led for us, I my heart breaks for people that don't believe. You are incredible. An incredible, wonderful God. Thank you for your blood. Thank you for your blood. Thank you.
In Jesus' name, amen. Hallelujah. I'm going to pass this over. Thank you for partaking of the blood and um, the body with us. And um, God bless you. Have a wonderful day. And be blessed. Um, be blessed by Pastor right now. We're going to build on what we started last week. We want to understand God's provision of human government. We want to understand that in the context of the gospel and the purposes of the Lord. So we're going to go where we basically left off last week. We're going to go to Romans chapter 13. Last week we talked about Romans 13, Ephesians chapter 6, and Matthew 22, 21 at the conclusion of our message, and we're going to start there and try to elaborate. Holy Spirit, grant us grace to articulate, grant us grace to understand and receive, and grant us grace for the power to last on the cell phone to finish this message in Jesus' name. What we said about Romans 13, Romans 13, 1 through 7, Paul deals with God's provision for government. Now, the Lord talks about the purpose of the church in the verses preceding Romans 13, 1 through 7, and he talks about the purposes of the church after 13, 1 through 7, and we must understand that. We must recognize the context within which this is uh, portrayed by Paul. Romans is about the gospel, the words that have been used previous to chapter 13, God's grace, God's justification by faith, the obedience of the church, justice, the establishment of justice, not just justification by faith, but justice in the earth, the Lord's dealing with sin and death and bringing life. All of that pertains to the gospel. Paul starts Romans with, I am not ashamed of the gospel. It's the power of God unto salvation for all those who believe. But when we, we, we look at those gospel terms, terms which apply to the church and the church's purpose in the earth, none of those terms are included in this passage on government. Government is something that the Lord establishes in the earth to bring forth his order in the earth. But the government does not bring the gospel. There's nothing in these verses in Romans 13, 1 through 7 that implies the gospel is a part of government. Human government does not bring the gospel, and we need to understand that. Let's pick up in Romans 12, verse 18. Again, we're going to see the church at the end of Romans 12. Then we're going to see government in Romans 13. Then we're going to see the church again at Romans 13 and 8. This is the purpose of the church. This is the church as being the embodiment of the gospel. This is the church proclaiming the gospel. This is the church bringing the gospel and bringing with it grace and faith and justice and justification and righteousness, all of those things. Romans 12, 18, if possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with all men. Now remember the biblical understanding of peace is shalom. Shalom is everyone having access to God's blessing. Justice means that everybody has access to shalom. Shalom is God's blessing. Living at peace with all men means we are the source of blessing for all men through the power of the gospel, through the power of grace, through the power of the Holy Spirit. Do not avenge yourselves, beloved ones. 
Now the word for vengeance here, and this is the word that is used at this point leading into Romans 13. It's used about government in 13 as well. What vengeance is, vengeance is this aspect of seeking to establish a th the, the justice of God, seeking to establish the justice of God, justice of God by your own means. And vengeance has to do with forcibly punishing violators of justice. The church is not to be involved in forcibly punishing violators of justice. That, that function belongs to human government and to God. Do not avenge yourself. Do not seek your own human means to establish justice in the earth. That's being directed to the church because he says, beloved ones. Then he says, but give place to the wrath of God. God is wrathful. Now, our church is reading the Psalms right now. And there's a lot in there where the, the psalmist or David or the king or, the, or Asaph or the sons of Korah or the priests or the people, whoever singing the Psalms, reciting the Psalms, talk about God, the God of vengeance, exercising his judgment upon the enemies of God. What we need to understand is this. What that means is God punishes evildoers. When people oppress other people, when people destroy other people, when people harm other people, when people harm God's creation, the Lord has the right to punish those people. That's what vengeance is. And punishment means righting the wrong that the enemies of God are perpetrating. It's called the wrath of God. We are not called in the church to embrace the wrath of God. God embraces the wrath of God. In other words, as human beings, we can't do. As, as members of the body of Christ, as preachers of the gospel, we cannot do what God does. God can do it. We can't do it. We are to give place to his wrath, for it is written, there's the word again, vengeance is mine. God can establish justice in the earth. God can punish evildoers, those who do not perform justice. Vengeance is mine. What we are just told we can't do, he's saying he can because he's God and we're not. Vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. Now, again, he goes back. What is our purpose as the church? He says, I'll take care of enforcing justice. Here's what you're to do. But if your enemy hungers, feed him. If he thirsts, give him a drink. For by doing this, you will heap fires of coals upon his head. Purification. We are called to love. God is called to exercise vengeance. We are called to love. That never changes for the church. The church doesn't get into a position where the church begins to enforce vengeance. He says, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good, the good. And we overcome evil by, as vessels of the gospel, performing peace seeking to bring blessing to people, seeking to bring the gospel to people, seeking to transform people's lives. Now, now with that context in the background, God over here, the church over here, now the Lord, through Paul, brings in human government. We said we have to understand human government in terms of powers and principalities. That's what human government is. The Lord has established certain powers and principalities, supernatural ruling authorities in the heavenly places, they are actually behind the authority of human government. Human beings are human beings. The power, though, that we call government, what we would call political power, there are supernatural, 
sources of that power put in place by the Lord to keep order in the earth. Not human beings. The, the conglomerate reality that we call politics are powers and principalities. Supernatural beings that the Lord has established in the earth to keep order and to empower human government to perform God's will in the earth. Let every person submit themselves to the higher powers. See, that's the Greek word for powers. I'm going to read it in terms of powers and principalities so we can see it. It's actually the word authority, but it's this particular word in the Greek is the power to enforce the authority that God gives to human government. And people are to subject themselves, submit themselves, come under the order. It's interesting, all through scripture we're called to obey the Lord. It doesn't tell us here to obey the powers and principalities, but it calls us to put ourselves under them so that God's order can take place in the earth. Obedience is an allegiance word. I said that last week. Faith, obedience, those are allegiance words. Those are words that show our allegiance to Jesus. And we are not to have the same allegiance to government that we have to Jesus. He says, there is no power except that which comes from God, and the power that exists have been appointed by God. Therefore, the one who opposes the power, the power that God has ordained, has opposed God. And the ones who oppose themselves to this will receive judgment. We are to submit to order and decency and good. Verse 3, for the principalities, the rulers now, so it's powers and principality. The word that's used are powers in the first two verses. In verse 3, we introduce rulers. Those are principalities. This is, these are the principles that govern human rulers who partake in the political process. For the principalities are not a terror to good works, but to evil works. Do you not want to be afraid of the power? Then do good and you'll have praise from it. Human government is there for us to embrace good. It says they have the authority to do good and that good is the common good. So God's order is established and, and, and we'll, we'll see that as we continue. But God's order is established in the earth, number one, by restraining evil, punishing evildoers, and by attempting to bring forth the common good. All people having access to good, having access to blessing, having access to a, a life that can be lived out to flourishing, to human flourishing. 13.4 says, for these ruling powers and principalities, human government is the servant of God for the common good. But if you do evil, be afraid, for the ruling authority does not bear the sword in vain, but he is a servant of God. He as is an avenger for the wrath of God to those practicing evil. We need to understand the limits of human authority. They are there not to establish morality. The Lord establishes morality. The Lord establishes justice. And justice comes from scripture. It comes from the person of God. It comes from the gospel. It doesn't emerge in the government. The government is to receive God's justice and then to make sure that that justice works in the earth. Government is not the source of justice. The word of God is the source of justice. The person of God is the source of justice. Therefore, it's necessary, again, to submit yourselves, to put yourself under the order 
of human government, not only because of the wrath of God, where, where the Lord will restrain evil, will use the government to restrain evil, but also because of conscience sake. See, human beings are made in the image and likeness of God, and regardless of how sin has distorted the image of God in man, their human beings have a conscience, and that conscience is still linked to what God has spoken from the beginning is justice, righteousness, and truth. We continue. For because of this, because the government is there, human government is there to keep order, we have to finance government. It says, because of this, for the same reason, you also pay taxes for the public servants are God's servants, busy with this very thing. They do this continually, and we need to finance government. You know, you finance the work of God by the tithe, and you finance the work of human government by taxes. And then it says, pay to all what is due them. Give to all, render to all what is due them. Now, it's very interesting about rendering to Caesar what is Caesar and to God's what is God's. That's what Jesus said in Matthew twenty-two twenty-one 21, when they asked him, the same word, render to Caesar what is Caesar's and to God what is God's. Paul says he uses it here in Romans 13, 7. He says, render to all what is due them. Taxes to whom taxes are due, revenue to whom revenue is due, Respect to whom respect is due, honor to whom honor is due. Jesus was saying, Caesar has a place. And you render to Caesar what belongs to Caesar, what his ministry is empowered to do, what Caesar is empowered to do, what human government is empowered to do to restrain evil, to to punish injustice and to work for the common good. That is Caesar's realm. We are to render to Caesar what is Caesar's. But God has a realm that does not belong to Caesar. The source of justice, the source of righteousness, the source of truth is in God and not in Caesar. And when we begin to look to Caesar, when we begin to look to human government, we are not understanding what Jesus said, render to Caesar what is Caesar's and God what is God's. The gospel belongs to God. Grace, righteousness, truth, justice, obedience, faith, that belongs to God. What belongs to Caesar is we submit ourselves under Caesar's rule. Now it's interesting. So you have the church, word of love, the government, it's to enforce what God has given it authority to do, and that is not creation of justice. That's not creation of morality. It is simply understanding what is God's justice and God's morality and functioning according to those precepts of the Lord. The church comes back in in the eighth verse. And just as, just as Paul has said, what we owe to human government, he turns around and he says again, he's, he's contrasting the church. The church is to love. The church is not to owe anything to the government beyond what God has established for the government. He says, owe no one anything except to love one another. For the one who loves the other has fulfilled the law. And then he quotes scripture from the law. For you shall not commit adultery, you shall not commit murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet. And if any other commandment in this word, it is summed up in this. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love does not work evil to your neighbor. Love, therefore, is the fulfillment of law. 
The church lives in a different realm from human government, and we cannot attribute to human government anything divine that God commits to the church and the church alone. We are called to fulfill the law of love. And Jesus himself said it. You've heard it said. He said it in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 5. My constitution is in Matthew 5, 6, and 7, the Sermon on the Mount, that I follow as a believer in Christ, as a follower of Jesus. You've heard it said in the law, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But wait a second. I tell you, love your enemy. Pray for those who persecute you and use you wrongly and unjustly, and you'll be the servants of your Father in heaven. The church is under a different law. Now, Paul speaks positively here in Romans 13 of powers and principalities. The supernatural beings that are behind human government that give human government their authority. Human beings exercise that authority. Politicians, kings, emperors, presidents, they, they, they exercise that authority, but that authority comes from the heavenly realm. Powers and principalities that the Lord has put in place. Paul speaks positively about those powers and principalities in Romans. But when we go to Ephesians chapter 6, spiritual warfare chapter. Paul says in Ephesians 6, now there might have been 10, 11 years difference between Paul writing in Romans 13 and Paul writing in Ephesians chapter 6. It's the same Roman empire that he's under. He has a positive slant that he gives to it in Romans 13, but there's a negative slant. slant. 11, 12 years later, Paul is, is, is saying, be careful. He's telling us, excuse me, he's telling us to be obedient to the Lord and to subject ourselves to the powers and principalities in Revelation, uh, Romans 13, but he says in Ephesians 6, verse 10, finally, my brothers, be empowered in the Lord and in the might of his strength. Put on the whole armor of God in order that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For our wrestling is not against flesh and blood. It's not about human beings, but against principalities, against powers. And he uses the same terminology here that he used in Romans 13. Principalities and powers are there behind human government to authorize them. But now he takes a different view. He says, the very armor that we need to put on as Christians has to do with the fact that powers and principalities can go rogue. He says, we are wrestling against not human beings, but spiritual realities of power principalities and powers against the cosmic rulers of this present darkness, against spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Powers and principalities, human government can go rogue, and the church needs to be aware of this, and the church needs to understand how it needs to deal with it. Now, Paul talks about putting on the armor, and at the end of the armor, he brings up we combine that armor with prayer. And this is important for us. 6.18, he says, with every prayer and every intercession, praying at all times in the Spirit, to this very end, keeping watch with all perseverance and intercession concerning all the saints. That's in the context of human government. We are to pray and watch for the saints and pray for perseverance and for me in order that utterance may be given to me in opening my mouth to make known boldly the mystery of the gospel. The gospel, whether it's in Romans 
13 and 12 or Ephesians 6, the gospel is always countered with powers and principalities, with human government. And we need to remember that and we need to understand that. The gospel is outside of the realm of powers and principalities. We subject ourselves under powers and principalities for order and for the common good. But what happens when powers and principalities go rogue? How do they go rogue? Well, I suggested last week, first of all, it's when they, we begin to attribute to Caesar what is God's. Powers and principalities may demand worship for themselves. There, there, are, there are two areas we need to be very careful about for powers and principalities. I'm going to read a, a, a short story here. 2 Chronicles chapter 26. Go with me to the 16th verse. In 2 Chronicles 26, the 16th verse, we have the story of Uzziah. Uzziah is the king of Israel. Keep this in mind. When God establishes, when God ordains ministry, and see, human government is a ministry that for from God, which God has established for the good of man and for the furthering of his purposes. Human government is a ministry. That's what Romans 13 says, that the, the, the person uh, in that place of human government, he, in this case, it, the person is powers and principalities. It's these supernatural beings. He's a servant of the Lord to bring forth the purposes of God ordained through government. Government cannot usurp the authority of another ministry. Every ministry has boundaries. You cannot transgress those boundaries. You cannot move beyond those boundaries. When a human being, when a government, when a minister, when a boss, when a politician, when a husband moves beyond the ordained boundaries that God has placed in that ministry, that ministry goes rogue. Watch. Second Chronicles 16. Uzziah was a mighty king. He's actually considered one of the godly kings in the line of David. Second Chronicles 16 says, but when Uzziah was strong, <laughs> it's not only we have problems when we're weak, we have problems when we get strong. When we get strong, our strength and power goes to our head and we begin to usurp our boundaries. But when he was strong, his heart was lifted up to his destruction. For he transgressed against the Lord his God by entering the temple of the Lord to burn incense on the altar of incense. The king is not ordained to burn incense on the altar of incense. That's the job of the priest. He's transgressed the boundaries of his ministry. So Azariah the priest went in after him, and with him were 80 priests of the Lord, valiant men. They stand against the king, the most powerful man in Israel. They stand against the king. And they withstood King Uzziah and said to him, It is not for you, Uzziah, to burn incense to the Lord, but for the priests, the sons of Aaron, who are consecrated to burn incense. Get out of the sanctuary, for you have trespassed and you shall have no honor from the Lord your God. Then Uzziah became furious, and he had a censer in his hand to burn incense. And while he was angry with the priests, leprosy broke out on his forehead between the priests in the house of the Lord beside the incense altar. Uzziah went beyond the boundaries ascribed to him by his anointing beyond the call of God of what a king could do. A king can't do what a priest can do. Now, this is what human government is all about. Human government can transgress its boundaries and begin to take on a God-like status in the hearts and minds of the people of a nation. It can begin to replace what God alone can do or what God has given to the church to do with its own political power. When that happens, the Lord calls those powers and principalities into judgment. He calls them rogue. 
Now, I will. I want to. I want to suggest something here. Isn't it interesting? What was the penalty of Uzziah? What was the penalty of Uzziah for usurping the authority of the priesthood, going beyond the authority God had given him as king? He was smitten with a plague, with leprosy. May I suggest? COVID-19 is the Lord speaking to us through nature, and he is calling this nation, he's calling the church, and he's calling the nations of the earth and the people of God throughout the earth. Get back in your boundaries. Powers and principalities can seek to usurp the authority of the Lord. Turn with me to Psalm 82. Got to locate it here. Psalm 82. We're going to see a picture of powers and principalities as the Lord sees them and as the Lord grants them authority in the earth. First of all, Psalm 82 is a psalm of Asaph. My church knows because we've been going through one psalm a day now for almost 300 days. We've been going through one psalm a day and Asaph is a prophetic psalm. The, the, the descendants of Asaph were prophetic Levites, prophetic, uh, 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 pro a prophetic aspect of the priesthood that declared prophetically. Their psalms are prophetic. Some psalms are born in worship. Some are born in teaching wisdom. Some are born out of the cry of prayer of God's people to God, but some psalms are prophetic. The psalms of Asaph are prophetic. Here's what it says. God, the true God, stands in the council of El. God stands in the council of God. This is talking about a heavenly council, a supernatural council made up of the Lord and divine beings. By divine beings, we don't mean angelic beings. Angels are supernatural beings, but scripture is replete with all kinds of divine beings that populate the universe. In the New Testament, Paul calls them thrones and dominions and powers and principalities. In the book of Revelation, there are these living creatures and 24 elders before the throne of the Lord. Those are supernatural beings. We live in a universe not only populated by human beings, not only populated by animals and creatures, but populated by supernatural beings. And there is something known as the heavenly council. And God takes his place as the ultimate God in the divine council. It says, in the midst of this council of God, the Lord renders judgment. He renders justice, is the Hebrew word for mishpat. And then the Lord cries out and says, how long he's speaking to these divine beings, these powers and principalities, these thrones and dominions that exercise his authority in the earth. He says, how long will you judge unjustly? Now the Lord has an issue with the powers and principalities and it's rooted in justice, biblical justice. The first place that powers and principalities transgress their boundaries is when they demand worship of themselves instead of God. When nations become God-like, when human rulers become God-like, when they demand for themselves what can only be demanded by God, Powers and principalities have transgressed their boundaries, and the church is called prophetically to stand with Asaph and declare the word, no, you will not. The second area where powers and principalities, where human government, where human leaders begin to transgress their borders is when they fail to understand they're called to bring justice to the peoples of the earth. How long will you judge unjustly and show 
partiality to the wicked. The wicked are those who rebel against the Lord's authority. These powers and principalities go rogue when they rebel against the Lord's authority instead of seeking to establish God's authority in the earth. Give justice. This is what the Lord says to, these are the B'nai Elohim, the sons of God. These, these powers and principalities are sons of God. They rule in the earth on the Lord's behalf. A son is supposed to do what his father tells him. He considers them his sons. Not necessarily in the same way that we, the saints, are the sons of God, but there's interesting terminology. We are called the sons of God because the church is really the source of greater authority of God in the earth than even the political powers are. Because all the political powers have to do, that their authority, they try to enforce morality by laws. We declare the gospel and we transform people's hearts. But if they're going to enforce morality by laws, those laws need to be just. And look what God calls to these powers and principalities. Give justice to the weak. Give justice to the fatherless. Maintain the right of the oppressed and the destitute. Rescue the weak and the needy. Again, deliver them from the hand of the wicked ones. What are the wicked ones? those who have transgressed God's power and seek to establish their own authority apart from God's justice, apart from the gospel, apart from the worship of the true God in the earth. Human government is to involve itself with the common good. It is to minister to the vulnerable in the earth, the hurting in the earth, those who have justice removed from them those who have evil perpetrated against them. This is the role of human government, not to establish itself in any kind of godlike perspective. Then he says about these sons of God, these powers and principalities, they have neither knowledge nor understanding. They don't have discernment. They don't have true divine knowledge. They're not they are not walking in revelation and discernment as the church is called to. All the foundations of the earth are shaken as they walk around in darkness, the cosmic rulers of the world darkness. When government usurps its authority, it transgresses its boundaries, usurps the authority of the Lord, the foundations of the earth are shaken. I said to you, you are gods, you are the sons of the Most High God. See, he's the Most High God. That El Elyon in Hebrew is the God over all the gods, the God, capital G, over all the other gods, small g, the powers and principalities. I said, you are gods, you are the sons of the Most High, all of you. Nevertheless, you shall die and fall like any prince. Important word, powers and principalities. You shall die like any human prince. And then the, the prophetic psalmist says, arise, O God, judge the earth, bring your justice into the earth, for you shall inherit all the nations. You shall die like any prince. Turn with me to Daniel chapter 10. Daniel 10 really sums all of this up for us. Daniel 10 gives us clear-cut instruction. In Daniel 10, and we'll start in the first verse. Now, Daniel 10 verse 1 says, In the third year of Cyrus, the king of Persia. Kings are going to be involved in this. Kings are the human embodiment of political authority. They're the human embodiment behind the powers and principalities. In the third year of Cyrus, king of Persia, a word was revealed to Daniel, whose name was Belteshazzar. The word was true, and it was in the midst of a great conflict. And he understood the word and had understanding of the vision. 
This word comes to Daniel in the midst of great conflict. There's a political, there is a political transition of power in the earth from Babylon ruling the earth to Persia. The Lord has put Babylon down and has lifted Persia up. It's the hour and the time and the season for Persia to dominate. And so there's this conflict. And I want you to see when political events take place in the earth, we see the conflict on the earth, but they are precipitated by heavenly conflict. When, when, when nations rise and nations fall, there's, there's the same kinds of things going on in the heavenly places between the powers and principalities, the sons of God who are called to rule in the earth. In those days, I, Daniel, was mourning for three weeks. He's fasting. I ate no delicacies. No meat or wine entered my mouth, and I did anoint, nor did I anoint myself at all for the three full weeks. On the 24th day of the first month, as I was standing on the bank of the great river, that is the Tigris, now Daniel is a, one of God's people. He's a prophet. And as a prophet, he's announcing what God has shown to him about powers and principalities. He's already had the vision in Daniel 7 where uh, the, the beast, the four beasts, the four great human empires come up before the Lord. In Daniel 7, they come up before the Ancient of Days and a son of man comes up as well and the power, political power, ultimate political power in the earth power to determine the kingdom of God, to determine the worship of God, to determine the authority of the people of God, to determine how God's purposes in human history are going to work out. It's not given to those four beasts. Those four beasts represent Babylon, Persia, Greece, Rome. They don't have final say in the earth, in human history. The Son of Man does. Jesus does. The Lord does. Daniel's already seen this, but now he's actually seeing the first transition of power from the Babylonian Empire, which Israel was under, to the Persian Empire. And he's fasting. He's concerned. There's, there's great conflict. He senses the conflict in his spirit, just as the church ought to be sensing the conflict right now. I mean, we see it. We see it with everything that's going on, but are we sensing the spiritual dimension? Of the conflict. I lifted up my eyes and looked, and behold, a man clothed in linen with a belt of fine gold from Uphaz around his waist. His body was like beryl, his face like the appearance of lightning, his eyes like flaming torches, his arms and legs like the gleam of burnished bronze, and the sound of his words like the sound of a multitude. And I, Daniel, alone saw the vision for the men who were with us or who were with me, did not see the vision, but a great trembling fell upon them, and they fled to hide themselves. It's similar to when Paul uh, encountered Jesus on the road to Damascus. He saw and heard the Lord. Everybody else ran. They headed for the hills. So I was left alone and saw this great vision, and no strength was left in me. My radiant appearance was fearfully changed, and I retained no strength. Then I heard the sound of his words, and as I heard the sound of his words, I fell on my face in a deep trance-like sleep with my face to the ground. And behold, a hand touched me and set me trembling on my hands and knees. Now, the image here goes to Revelation 1. That's what happened to John in Revelation 1 when Jesus appeared to him. And by the way, the, the description of this supernatural being that Daniel encounters is similar to Jesus in Revelation 1. We can draw a biblical inference, this is Jesus. Jesus as the angel of the Lord, as the, the ultimate prince, the prince of peace, not the prince of human government, but the prince of peace, not the prince of Persia or the prince of Greece, but the prince of peace. The prince of peace comes and says, Daniel, before you understand how powers and principalities work, you need to see me. You need to see me. You saw the Son of Man in chapter 7, now you're going to see me as the angel of the Lord in chapter 10. His hand touched me and set me trembling on my hands and knees, and he said to me, O Daniel, man greatly beloved, beloved, 
Romans 12, beloved, Romans 13, love. Oh yes, human government's in the middle of the bookends of loving. You're called to love. You're called to bring the gospel. Human beings simply bring human government. O man greatly loved, understand the words that I speak to you and stand upright, for now I have been sent to you. And when he had spoken this word to me, I stood up trembling. Well, we're having a, uh, we're having here a uh, equipment deficit. I'm trying to read this in the light where I can see it without turning my head. Is the sound still on? Are we good? I hope so. Let me know if it's not. And when he had spoken this word to me, I stood up trembling. Verse 12. Then he said to me, Fear not, Daniel, for from the first day you set your heart to understand and humbled yourself before your God. Your words were heard, and I have come because of your words. We need to seek to understand this in our heart. We need to humble ourselves before our God. This is what the church needs to do in this hour as never before. Instead of identifying with arrogant claims of government, we need to humble ourselves and seek to understand the word of the Lord. Your words have been heard. I've come for your word. Watch this. What did the Lord say to those rogue powers and principalities in Psalm 82? You shall die as a prince if you don't do my word. The prince of the kingdom of Persia, this is what the Lord, the angel of the Lord is saying. Nations have princes. Those princes are powers and principalities. They're the sons of God. And just as there's turmoil on the earth, there's human governments uh, uh, changing and transitioning and, 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 and God is removing one power and establishing another. It's going on in the heavenly realms as well. The prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me 21 days. But Michael, one of the chief princes, Michael is the prince of Israel. So here's the angel of the Lord. He's being withstood by the prince of Persia. In other words, a, hum a, a supernatural prince a human earthly government opposing the Lord in his purposes. But Michael, the prince of Israel, comes alongside and aids the angel of the Lord. One of the chief princes came to help me, for I was left there with the kings of Persia. The prince of Persia, supernatural entity, influences the authority of the kings of Persia. And I came, come to make you understand what is happening to your people in the latter days, for the vision is yet to come. When he had spoken to me according to these words, I turned my face toward the ground and was mute. And behold, one of the likeness of the sons of men touched my lips. Then I opened my mouth and spoke, and I said to him who stood before me. Now this is all. This is Daniel interacting with all these supernatural beings, all these supernatural entities, including the Lord Jesus. I opened my mouth and spoke, and I said to him who stood before me, O my Lord, by reason of the vision, pains have come upon me, and I retain no strength. How can my Lord's servant talk with my Lord? For now no strength remains in me, and no breath is left in me. Again, one having the appearance of a man touched me and strengthened me. And he said, O man, greatly loved, fear not. Peace be with you, be strong and of good courage. And we need Jesus to touch us in this hour. The church needs to touch us. I mean, the Lord needs to touch us, the church, so that we can rise up prophetically and speak the truth and embody the gospel and proclaim the gospel and proclaim the lordship of Jesus Christ in the earth right now. And he spoke to me and I was strengthened and I said, let my Lord speak for you strengthen me. Well, he just wants to be strengthened to even hear the Lord, let alone to speak for the Lord. And that's what the church needs in this hour. We need to be strengthened to really hear what God is saying and not what the powers and principalities are saying, and not what false prophecy is saying, and not what false teaching is declaring. The church needs to hear Jesus. Then he said, do you know why I've come to you? 
But now I will return to fight against the prince of Persia. And when I go out, behold, the prince of Greece will come. But I will tell you what is inscribed in the book of truth. There is none who contends by my side against these except Michael, your prince. We have powers and principalities. You have the prince of Persia because Babylon is being set down and Persia is going to be established in the place of a world empire, political authority. Greece is going to follow Persia. Greece is going to follow Persia. And Greece is going to take over. After that, Rome will take over. Prince of Babylon, Prince of Persia, Prince of Greece, Prince of Rome. And it is the rogue power of Rome that Paul begins to deal with in the New Testament and that John begins to deal with in Revelation chapter 13. Now, what's the significance of this, brethren? Well, the significance of this is today in the earth, there's a prince of Russia, there's a prince of Iran, there's a prince of China, and there is a prince of America. The princes are not God. They are powers and principalities put into place to bring order in the earth. But when powers and principalities begin to usurp their authority, the Prince of America can usurp its authority. When the Prince of America begins to desire the devotion that is given to Jesus alone, that prince has stepped out of its boundaries. It's transgressing. When it begins to demand worship, and we have an allegiance issue in America, Jesus or America, we live in America, we pray for America, we pray for our political leaders, we pray for the members of the Supreme Court, we pray for our legislature, we pray for, for our, our public workers, we pray for those, but that is part of the Prince of America. And my question to the church in this hour is, are we listening to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ? Establishing the gospel, worshiping him, being obedient to him, or have we begun to listen to a rogue prince that is beginning to demand allegiance to itself and is forsaking justice in our nation? The, the powers and principalities that rule a nation function along these lines. Look at Acts chapter 17 for me. Go to Acts 17. Paul is speaking to the Greeks in Athens, and he says in verse 26 of Acts 17, he says, from one ancestor one common human source. God made all nations to inhabit the whole earth. And here's important. And he allotted to them the times of their existence and the boundaries of the places where they would live. The Lord determines human history, every nation, from Israel to Babylon to Persia to Egypt to Assyria to Moab to Edom in ancient times to Rome to Greece to in the modern times the Lord has determined these, these times and seasons and boundaries for America, for China, for the nation of Israel, for Iran, for South Africa, for Argentina, for Mexico, for Canada, for Australia. The Lord determines. And the interesting thing, the word for seasons, seasons and fixed boundaries, is kairos. Kairos is the Greek word for prophetic perspective, prophetic time. 
what it means that the Lord has determined the times, the prophetic times of the nations, is that every nation has a purpose. Just like every ministry has a purpose, every nation has a purpose. Nations have historical purposes. We call it eschatology, to help the purposes of the Lord be advanced in the earth. America is part of that. America has a foundation, a founding. It has origin stories. It has founding stories. And those founding stories are put into motion by the principalities and kept in power by the powers. See, principalities, uh, principalities are first principles. They're ruling spirits that God commissions. Here's going to be the purpose of America. Here's how many years America is going to last. Here are the boundaries of America. And here is the prophetic purpose that America has. America has a prophetic purpose. It's not God's chosen nation. The church is God's chosen nation. Blessed are the people, the nation, whose God is the Lord. Who's that referring to? God's people. We're the nation. We're the holy nation whose God is the Lord. The rest of the nations have a history determined by God's purposes and these ruling powers, the, the powers, the authorities enforce authority to carry out that nation's history in, in light of God's purposes for it. And the principalities determine the principles under which it is going to carry out its prophetic purpose and destiny. But the Lord has established these. And when powers and principalities get strong, just like Uzziah. See, the Lord said in Deuteronomy 8, I'm not worried about you. You're a weak people right now. I'm worried when you get strong that you're going to what? You're going to look around all these blessings and say, my own hand has gotten these, me these things. And you forget the Lord. See, the Lord is always humbling his people to bring them back to reality. He's our source. But see, nations get strong, and when nations get strong, the powers and principalities begin to usurp their authority. Church, you need to be praying right now. Has America usurped its authority in terms of God's purposes? And now the church is being called to have uh, an allegiance to the nation that's greater than our allegiance to God, I just say this, wake up, church, in the name of Jesus. Wake up, church, in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Now, let's go to 2 Thessalonians. We've got a couple minutes and we're going to close. 2 Thessalonians. Paul is talking about the day of the Lord. And by the way, in terms of when did Paul write these things, Paul probably wrote Romans in the early 50s, early to mid 50s. He would have written 2 Thessalonians before Romans and he wrote Ephesians after Romans. So this positive view of government, powers and principalities, is bookended on both sides with 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, Ephesians chapter 6. He talks about the day of the Lord. I want to look at verse 3. Let no one deceive you, Paul says. The day of the Lord will not take place in any way unless there comes the apostasy first, the rebellion. Powers and principalities rebel against the Lord. They begin usurping the authority of the Lord by demanding that we worship them that we worship the nation, that we worship the national myths, the national constitution over the Lord and the word of God. They begin to usurp authority. They begin to rebel against God. And then that rebellion spreads to human beings, including the members of the church. Paul is warning the church here. He says the apostasy is going to come first. That An apostasy is rebelling against the Lord as the true source of worship, the only one who is to be worshipped, and the source of justice. And apostasy, interesting, apostasy in the Greek is a bill of divorce. And it's not saying necessarily the Lord's going to divorce us. It's we're divorcing the Lord. 
for something false. And it says two things are going to happen. The apostasy takes place. We begin to rebel against the Lord. And the man of lawlessness, the son of destruction, is revealed. The wicked one. The lawless one. And this is just, it's just, we're not talking about one person being the Antichrist. We're talking about a nation going rogue. Powers and principalities going rogue on the Lord. This is the one, and notice verse 4. This is the perfect description of one of the two aspects of where powers and principalities go rogue. This one sets itself against and exalts itself against everything called God, every object of worship, so that he sits in the temple of God presenting himself as God. When we begin to attribute divine powers to any nation, any political system, when we begin to attribute divine powers to that, we are entering into this dangerous warning that Paul gives the church. We can, nothing can have our allegiance more than Jesus Christ. Nothing can have our allegiance. Not the not the servants of the powers, the ruling powers. Who are the servants of the powers politically? The Democratic Party and the Republican Party. They're both servants of the powers and principalities. Do you understand the origin story of America? America is supposed to have diversity, different parties, so that no one party rules, so that no one perspective rules. America is unity in the midst of diversity. That's the prophetic history of America. When one power seeks to rule over the other power, when one party seeks to say, we're more righteous than the other party, let God be true and all parties liars, when one party, they're, 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 they're embracing the manifestation of powers and principalities that have gone rogue. They're imaging our war, our war in our country between red states and blue states is imaging the battle that's going on in the heavenly places between a rogue power and principality and the Lord himself. And the church needs to Get back to the truth. I'm going to close with this because because I I am it looks like I'm losing power here. Close in Matthew 25. I want you to see an aspect of Matthew 25 that goes along with everything that we're teaching here. I'm summoning Matthew 25. Yes, to my cell phone. Matthew 25. I want, I want you to see this. This has to do with the gospel. Final judgment, Matthew 25, 31. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit on his glorious throne. See, there's the true ruler of the universe. Not powers and principalities, the true universe, the Son of Man. Before him will be gathered all the nations. This is, Matthew 25 is a picture of the judgment of nations. This is, this is Psalm 82. This is, this is, I'm calling all my powers and principalities behind these nations and I'm calling them before the throne of the Son of Man and we're going to judge you whether you transgressed your boundaries or whether you kept within your boundaries. Before him will be gathered all the nations, and he will separate peoples, one from another, as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he will place the sheep on his right, but the goats on his left. Then the king, see there's, there's true authority, ultimate authority. The king will say to those on his right, come you who are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. And what's the basis of judgment? What, what did he call the, the sons of God in, in Psalm 82? To defend the vulnerable, the weak, 
the oppressed, the poor, the destitutes, the orphan, the refugee. They're all there, those who are vulnerable to injustice. For I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was a stranger and you welcomed me. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you drink? And when did we see you a stranger and welcome you or naked and clothe you? And when did we see you sick or in prison and visit you? And the king will answer them, truly I say unto you, as you did it to one of the least of these, my brothers, you did it to me. Okay, my brothers, Christian poor, but fine. A nation, how a nation treats its Christian poor, but he, 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 he gives a, another image to those who are judged. Verse 41, then he will say to those on his left, depart from me, you cursed into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry and you gave me no food. I was thirsty and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger, you did not welcome me. Naked and you did not clothe me. Sick and in prison and you did not visit me. Then they also will answer saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and did not minister to you? Then he will answer them saying, truly I say to you, as you did not do it to one of the least of these. Now it's not the least of my brethren. It's just the least of all of these. You did not do it to me. It's all the citizens of a nation. And these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. Let me make a couple closing statements. This isn't like a nice passage about, hey, let's establish a food pantry and, and, and work, for, work with the poor. This is how Jesus is going to judge the nations of the earth when he returns. That's number one. Number two, this is not judgment by good works. It's saying that if we really, if the nations embrace, embrace the justice of God, then they will act consistent with that justice. Those are the ones who come into eternal life. It's people who've embraced the justice of the living God because they've embraced the Son of Man and the gospel. Those who don't embrace justice and worship as the Lord has set it out, they've, they've, uh, they live out their lives accordingly. Final statement. Oh, let's see, which American political party embraces the judgment of Matthew 25? Well, that's what I'm leaving you with, to seek the Lord and pray. But, oh, spoiler alert, neither. The church has got to come to a place the church has got to come to a place where our, we, ha we don't have any longer greater allegiance to a political party than to our brothers and sisters in Christ, greater allegiance to a nation than to our God in heaven. May the Lord bless us. May the Lord be with us. May we accomplish these things, Father. Let your word cut like a sword. Let your truth come forth, Lord. We know that there are veils on the hearts of and the minds of your people, Lord, of the people of this nation, Lord, that cause them not to hear what your word is saying. Let your word go forth in power and might and glory, Lord. The church has got to come back to Jesus, Lord. Lord, bless America, but bless it as it follows your righteousness and your justice and your truth and worship of the creator, but God, get your church out of where it is right now. False allegiances, false prophecy. Purge us, O God. In the name of Jesus, we pray it. Amen. God bless you, brethren. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Amen.